Uh, more about loops. Okay, so loops are, are no weight. So the no weight clause on work sharing directives suppresses the barrier, the implied barrier at the end of the end of in this case the end of the loop. Okay, so if I have uh, I have two loops and I consider that I don't need barrier synchronization between them then I can put no weight on the first loop. So in that case, as soon as a thread has finished its iterations, its, its set of iterations in the first loop, it will carry straight on and start executing the second loop, even if other threads haven't finished the first one. So in the example I've got here, there is a Data dependency between these two loops. So the first loop iteration i write a of i, and the second loop iteration i reads a of i. Okay. So the question then is, is it then safe to put a no weight directive on the first loop and suppress the barrier? So what you need to guarantee is that the same threads are going to execute the same iterations in both loops. Okay? And this is guaranteed so long as the schedules are the same and they must be static. Okay? You can specify a chunk size or not um, and then you are guaranteed to get the same mapping of iterations and threads in both loops. Okay. So but if you have, for example, if you have different numbers of iterations, then all bets are off. Um, and if you use other shared schedules like dynamic or guided, then clearly all bets are off. And that won't work. As long as your schedule is static with or without a chunk size, the number of threads is the same, which you're guaranteed because you're inside the same parallel region, and the number of iterations is the same, then you are in fact guaranteed to get the same, same mapping of iterations and threads. So this often surprises people a, a bit. Uh, the default schedule Okay. If I have a loop directive and I don't specify a schedule clause, then the default schedule is in fact implementation defined. And so it doesn't have to be static. In practice, in all the implementations that I know of, the implementation default is static. Okay. But it's probably not a good idea to rely on that, you know, especially in cases where we are relying on it, like in the previous example, where we're using no weight and, and relying on particular mappings of iterations. So the default schedule is not static. By definition, in the standard, it's defined by the implementation. Can you set? <coughs> can you say something once to say that at the beginning of the program, but can you just that it so you don't need to go through? No. Okay. It's not a modifiable. There is an internal control variable which controls this, but it's not modifiable. So that's a little. In practice, it probably will never bite you. But one of those things that shouldn't really do it. Another consideration when we're using OpenMP loops is uh, if we have loops with loaded balance, then we want to specify the chunk size. 
Uh, and this gets, you know, this can be true for either static or dynamic schedules. You want to try and choose the optimal chunk size. Um, that can get quite tricky because the best chunk size can depend quite strongly on how many threads you're using. And usually you're not going to specify the number of threads. You're going to let whoever's running using the program choose how many threads they want. So, so choosing a good chunk size can be can be awkward. However, it's often more robust. Instead of tuning the chunk size directly, you tune the number of chunks per thread. And then derive chunk size from that. So the chunk, the expression you give to the chunk size in the, in the schedule clause does, does not have to be a compile time constant. It can be a variable. So you can you can decide how you get find a good number of chunks per thread, and then get the chunk size from that at runtime. That that often works better. It's easier to find a, a robust optimal value. Other things. So there are, if you're inside a parallel region and you want the block of code to be executed by one thread only, then OpenMP gives you two choices of how to do this. You can either use single construct or you can use the master construct. So which one should you use? Typically, master has lower overhead. Okay. So master says, do this on thread zero. So the implementation is trivial. It's just a test. Am I thread zero? Yes, execute this block of code. No, skip it. Single has more overhead because it requires some synchronization. So single says, am I the first thread to get here? If so, execute it, I'll skip it. But somewhere on somewhere in the implementation there has to, typically has to be a lock. So that the first thread gets there, you know, set some flag to say I was I, I've got somebody's got here, uh, everybody else who can count as this has to has to skip it. Um, so unless you you know unless you expect some threads to arrive before for others use master. If you expect there to be some load imbalance or expect some threads but you don't know which to get there first, then using single might be a good idea. You also be aware that there is this asymmetry in terms of synchronization. So master has no implied barrier at the end where a single does. And but if you use single and you don't want the barrier, then you can specify no weight. So if you want synchronization, use, use either single or master then barrier. If you don't want the synchronization, use master on its own or single but no weight. So C and C plus C and C plus programmers can go to sleep for a few minutes. Um, I'll wake you up when it's time to pay attention again. So Fortran 90 array syntax is uh, a little bit problematic for OpenMP because you can't loo use loop directives directly to parallelize that syntax. Uh, However, there is a directive which does allow you to do this, which is called work share, which is confusing because uh, it's kind of overloading terminology. So OpenMP work sharing directives include the loop directives and single and sections and work share. Um, and that allows you to parallelize Fortran 90 array operations and also other things like where and for all So a simple example where you just have array syntax which, which you know element wise adds two, two arrays together. 
that you can simply surround that with an OMP parallel and OMP work share uh, construct. The work share directive has no schedule clause and the distribution of work units, okay, where a work unit is basically considered to be you know, individual assignments to array elements, uh, is entirely up to the compiler. Uh, uh, and in simple cases, most implementations will do a decent job of that. Um, but if it doesn't, then unfortunately you have to, you may then need to expose one or more loops explicitly. Uh, and go back to using uh, OMP4 or, or, or OMP2 uh, to get the power of There is a synchronization point at the end of the work share, so it is like other work sharing directives, so there is an implied barrier there. All threads must finish their work before the thread can proceed. And you can have other things in there, so there can be array intrinsic functions, where for all constructs, uh, scalar assignments, uh, it can include atomic and critical directives. Uh, as usual with these things, you can't branch in or out of the block, and you, the only function calls you're allowed to make are array intrinsics and, and functions which are declared as elemental. And there is a shorthand combined version OMP parallel work share. So in principle, you can do fairly complicated, messy things like this. Okay, so you can have regular array syntax, where statements, um, an atomic scalar assignment, uh, a, an array intrinsic like sum, and four. And it's just up to the implementation to decide. So effectively, you have all those, all those individual element-wise assignments are uh, independent and, and can be done in parallel. So it's entirely up to the implementation how those can actually get mapped to play. Uh, and you've really got no control. And you just have to cross your fingers and hope it's going to do something. One of the most common sources of bugs in OpenMP programs is getting data sharing attributes wrong. So getting your shared private, first private reductions correct is important. One thing that uh, is easy to e very easy to overlook is that private variables are uninitialized on entry to parallel regions. Um, if you want them to be initialized, then you can use first private, which initializes them with, with the value that that variable has on entry to the parallel region. But actually, Sensible use cases for first private are, are fairly few and far between, and it's just more likely to be an error. Okay, it's more likely that you that you should have initialized your private variables before you use it. In your system. Something that I can't stress enough, but I'm going to try anyway, is default none. Okay, and I, I would recommend that you always always, no exceptions ever, use default none. Okay? And force yourself to declare every variable that appears in the scope of the parallel region as either shared, private, reduction, whatever. Okay? Why is this so important? Well, for two reasons. If you get it wrong, then the type of bugs that you have are really nasty. They typically race conditions, and debugging them is horrible, and you might not ever spot them. Okay, so you know the, your your program might run 100 times correctly, and 101st time the race condition is triggered, and you get an error. So it's the nastiest sort of bug. 
And the problem is that everybody suffers from, from what I call variable blindness, uh, which is a weird effect until you've seen it in action. If, if you give somebody a chunk of code and ask them to write down all the variables that are referenced in that chunk of code, then it's unbelievable how easy it is to overlook something. You think, how hard can that be? Ten lines of code, please write down all the variables that I use. Well, it's surprisingly and amazingly easy to, to miss some. Uh, and if you miss some, and they, you know, they, they should have been private, but they get shared by default because you didn't specify them. Nasty bugs. So just get yourself into the habit of doing it. And most of the, most of the part of implementations do a good job of telling you that these were the variables that you didn't, didn't declare. Uh, you just get a compile time failure and you get told the list of variables. These are the ones that can fail to include your in your private or shared or reduction clauses. So Here's a particularly nasty example. Okay. And so stop the bug. Well, that was a little bit difficult to do online. I'm not going to get you to write in. So um, the bug here is that the loop index J is shared by default. Not specified in the list of private variables or the list of shared variables, and therefore the default behavior is going to be shared. Loop index i is private because it is the parallel loop iterator. And this, this particular problem doesn't occur in Fortran because all Fortran loop iterators are private by default. You see, that's not true. The really, really nasty thing about this is that, provided you turn on enough compiler optimization, then that, that loop index variable J never really exists. It never gets stored in memory anywhere. Uh, what the compiler will generate is it says, oh, I, I know, you know, I'll just initialize a register with M. Every time I go around the loop, I'll decrement n and test again at zero, and then I'm done. So that's typically what you know, an optimized loop will look like in, in, in assembly code. So the variable j is never stored in memory, so this code will always work. You never see the bug until you happen to turn off your compiler optimization, and then it all goes wrong. As soon as J starts being stored in memory, you've then got multiple threads all trying to modify it and, and, and basically all hell breaks loose. So that kind of thing is a particularly nasty example where your race condition may you, 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 you can test it to your test it to your heart content content and you will never see the race condition unless you happen to test with help compiler optimization turned on. Okay, um, so many of you will find yourself at some point in the, in the, uh, in the business of parallelizing other people's code. Because okay, I know that none of you ever write code that looks like this. So what do you do in this situation? Okay, so you know, this is not uncommon, in, particularly in Fortran codes. Yet, you know, do I equals 1 to n? And then inside that loop, you get several pages of code ref referencing you know, maybe hundreds of variables. If that's my parallel loop, then I'm faced with trying to determine the correct scope of you know, private shared reduction for all those variables. Uh, it's tedious, 
it's error prone and it's difficult to test adequately. Because again, you know, if you get it wrong, it, it's a race. Does the race happen? Well, maybe sometimes, maybe not. The one solution to this is, is refactoring the code. Uh, so refactor the sequential code so that I extract the body of the loop into a separate subroutine. Then I can make all the loop temporary variables local to loop body. So all the, all, the, all the variables which are temporary inside the loop just become local variables which are declared inside the subroutine. And then pass the rest through the argument list. So you know, variables where I, you know, I care about the values coming into the loop or going out, I need to pass through the argument list. This then becomes much easier to test for correctness. Okay? Just this, just the refactoring becomes easy to test. Okay? It's just did I do this refactoring right? Well, it's just the sequential code. And now all those temporary variables are private by default because they're local variables inside a call subroutine. So this then becomes a whole lot easier. And then once so once you've refactored, tested the sequential code. It should then be much easier to parallelize because the number of variables that you're dealing with hopefully is a much smaller. And you've also done the analysis to understand whether they should be should be whether they really are temporary variables or not. Another nasty little trap uh, you can get into is with reductions. And the problem happens if you have, uh, if you do reductions on work sharing loops. So I'm inside a parallel region, and I, I then want to have a loop uh, with a reduction which only is. It only has the scope of the loop. So I want the result of the reduction at the end of the loop rather than at the end of the parallel region. Uh, I need to be careful with race conditions here because I can get into a situation where there's a race between the initialization of the reduction variable and the update to it, which is occurred implicitly at the end of the loop. So in this example, when I'm in the parallel region, sum is a shared variable. Uh, in this case, all threads set sum to zero. That's technically wrong in itself. That's a race condition. OpenMP specifies that all race conditions are, uh, are basically have non-deterministic behavior, even if it looks completely benign. Like all threads setting a variable to the same value, it's technically wrong anyway. But even so, uh, still need to have some synchronization between that initialization of the reduction variable and the implied assignment to it, which happens at the end of the OpenMP4 construct. What what can happen is that you know, one thread initializes it, the other threads all go away and compute their iterations of the for loop. They then update some with their local accumulated value. And then after that, some other thread, which is late, comes along and sets it back to zero again. And you lose that, you lose some of the, uh, some of the contributions from some. Uh, so that's a nasty one to, to watch out for. Another tricky one is, okay, um, 
climate global variables. Okay? So what happens in this case? So I have uh, I have a variable called food in in some program unit. In that program unit, I have a parallel region and I declare food as private. That parallel region calls function, some func, and some func also references foo, but it references it as a global variable by the by the external statement. The question is, that reference inside some func to foo, does that refer to the original storage? Does that refer to the shared, original shared copy? Or does that refer to every thread's private copy of foo? And the answer is, uh, you don't know. It's unspecified as to which of those will happen. One or other of those will happen. There will be a reference to one or other of those. But you just don't know which. Okay. Uh, this means that it's unportable because it might, you know, one implementation might do one thing, another implementation might do another. It rather depends on whether the compiler decides to inline the function or not. That can change the behavior. So basically, you just can't do this. If you want to access the private copy, then you need to pass it through the RTC. Be sure that you have what you access. So this is something that I've seen quite a few times happen to people and causes them to scratch their heads a lot. Okay. So you have a sequential code, and all you do is you compile it with the OpenMP flag. So the code contains no OpenMP directives, no OpenMP runtime library calls, nothing. It's just a plain ordinary, ordinary sequential code. You compile it with the OpenMP flag, and it breaks. So what earth happened there? And most people say, well, the compiler is broken, isn't it? Okay. Well, there's a couple of things that can, could cause this. Okay. You might have a bug in your code which is assuming that the contents of a local variable are preserved between function calls. Okay. And the reason this causes a problem is because compiling with the OpenMP flag forces all local variables to be stack allocated and not heap allocated. If I don't have the OpenMP flag on, then it's up to the compiler to decide. Okay? It, it's got a choice. It can make them, it can put them on the stack, it can put them on the heap, it's a sequential code, it doesn't matter. So with the OpenMP flag on, because uh, essentially uh, all local variables must be private to threads if, the, if that function is ever called inside a parallel region, then the way that the compiler ensures that is to stack allocate them so that they go on every thread local stack. So if you've got that type of bug, okay, this will break it. Um, so something you're implicitly assuming is heap allocated now becomes stack allocated. And also, this, this can also you can also break code like this because it causes stack overflow. And so if you have large arrays that are local to, to functions, the compiler might ordinarily decide, okay, I'm going to that's big, I'll put it on the heap. I turn the OpenMP flag on. I can't do that anymore. I can put it on the stack, and you overflow the stack. And so that's. That's something to watch out for. So those, those are possible things that can go wrong here. So you need to use the save or static language of choice correctly. Okay. Um, but then those variables will be shared by default, which probably isn't what you want. Um, so you might need to make them very private. Um, 
but the common uses, use cases for this is first time through code. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If this is the first time this function has been called, do something. Yeah. And then I assume that this, you know, and then the variable will have that value for L1. That will have an alt feature called to see something, will see that value. Uh, so that kind of code cause, does cause problems with OpenMP. Uh, you might need to refactor that somehow. Okay. For example, make sure that that first time through does get executed before you end the any parallel meeting. Uh, but a little bit about critical and atomic. Uh, it's I've ever seen a few times. You can't protect, protect updates to shared variables in one place with atomic and in another place with critical if they might contend with each other. There is no mutual exclusive guarantee between these. Um, critical, essentially, critical protects code, atomic protects memory locations. And so there's no way that the compiler actually knows which memory locations are being protected by critical. And so the example that I give there is, is incorrect. Okay. One thread could be executed in the critical region, another thread could be executed in the atomic at the same time, and then we get away. Okay. Sometimes it turns out you want to allocate storage whose size is determined by the, by the number of threads. Want to allocate an array of, or, uh, of which is dimensioned by the number of threads. But how do you know how many threads the next parallel region is going to use? Well, you can guess. Okay. Um, but there is, a, there, is a, there is a neat way of doing this. Can, there's a, 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 a runtime library function, OMP get max threads. And what that does is returns the value, the current value of the end thread bar internal control variable. And you're guaranteed that, except if you use a non thread clause, the number of threads used for the next parallel region will not exceed this. So it's therefore safe to allocate storage based on that number, and then you're guaranteed that your, the number of threads will be possible to it's always worth noting that implementations are, is, uh, there are, there are weird words in the specification which say implementation can always decide to deliver fewer threads than what you ask for. Okay. Uh, so if your code really strongly depends on there being a certain number of threads, then you should always check on entry to the parallel region. That is, that is how many threads you've got. Okay. Generally speaking, it's a good idea not to have code which is dependent on the number of threads anyway. But if you do, then you know, for if you want your code to be robust, you really ought to check because there are the, the implement there are always situations where the implementation can decide that it will give you less threads than what you ask for. Um, stack size. So I mentioned that a minute ago in the context of, the, of local variables. So if you have large private data structures, so you know, data structures private to each thread and they're large arrays, it's perfectly possible to run out of stack space. So every thread has its own stack, and the size of the thread stack, apart from the master thread, can be controlled by the OMP stack size environment variable. However, the size of the master thread stack is, has, has to be controlled in the same way as for sequential programming. So, for example, on Linux using new um, It's not possible for OpenMP to control this because in, you know, in most implementations, by the time the OpenMP runtime is called, then the process has already been initialized and the stack size has been set. Uh, and it's too late. So 
So it's not, it's, uh, you know, it's not an oversight, so there just is no sensible way of controlling that from inside open and PNA. So the master thread stack gets its stack size from whatever operating system control you have. All the other threads, you can set it with this wiring. Well, we're talking about environment variables, um, you know, so if you care about performance, which is most likely what most, most of us are, are, are here for, then there are some environment variables you should set to, to maximize performance and, and not to rely on defaults to be. So basically there are, there, are, there are three. So if you should set OMP weight policy equals active, which encourages idle threads to spin rather than go to sleep. It doesn't guarantee it. It's really just a hint of the OpenMP runtime. Um, so if threads are waiting as a barrier or waiting for a critical section, then it's, you know, for performance reasons, it's better that they spin weight rather than go to sleep and have to be working on it. Uh, you should set OMP dynamic equals false. Uh, so don't let the runtime have at least a plausible excuse for delivering you fewer threads than you asked for. Uh, so it, it still can if it really wants to, um, but this encourages it not to. And you should set OMP prop bind equals true, which prevents threads from migrating between cores. So uh, on Cray systems, then at least the last one isn't necessary. Because AP run takes care of the, the thread binding for you. So AP run on Archer binds, will bind the thread to cause anyway. So you don't need to do this now. Well. Uh, okay, and so my last couple of slides uh, are about tools which are generic and not about Archer in particular, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, stick, I'll skip through these fairly quickly. Um, so traditional buggers, debuggers like DDT and Total, Total View do have support for OpenMP. Uh, that's good, but it's not much help tracking down race conditions because you know, running under the debugger changes the timing of events on different threads. There are race detection tools which work in a different way. They capture all the memory accesses during the run and then analyze that data for races which might have occurred. Um, so there's a couple of tools that do that, so Intel Ex Inspector and uh, Oracle Studio uh, have, have this capability, which is, which is a, you know, a useful thing to, to use. Uh, profilers, so standard profilers, again, mostly work with, with, uh, with OpenMP, but what, what you get out of them tends to be confusing because they typically accumulate the time spent in functions across all the which may or may not be helpful. Uh, you can get an awful lot uh, of good information out of using timers. So OpenMP has its own uh, timing routine, obviously get dummy time. So typically what you know, but, uh, I would like to do is to add timers around every parallel region, around the whole code, and this lets you work out you know, which parallel regions have the worst to speed up, uh, and also lets you measure by subtraction the amount of time that you spend outside parallel regions. Uh, don't assume that that's independent of the number of threads. Okay, it's a common assumption that just because, you know, it's uh, because of um, non-uniform memory accesses and caches, then it's perfectly possible that the time you sp that the time spent in code outside of parallel regions goes up as you increase the number of threads. So it's good to, to measure that and watch out for it. It's an indication that your, your data affinity is good. Um, in terms of performance tools, okay, uh, things like BAMP, BAMP here, uh, timeline traces can be very useful for OpenMP uh, for visualizing the load balance and you know, the relative timing of events and threads. Uh, Intel has B-tune, that's fine. Uh, it's 
Scholastica is a nice tool. It's uh, it's a freely available one, which tries to break down the overheads into, into different categories. So it tries to give you an indication of not only where in the program your the problem is, but also you know, specific to OpenMP. You know, is the problem as I've got load imbalance or not enough power or something else. Uh, another nice tool, which is unfortunately rather expensive, is Roadway Thread Spotter. It's a statistical memory profiler, so it uses you know, a, a trace gathering and then simulation approach. Uh, it's very good for finding cache and memory problems, and it's about the only tool which will reliably and sensibly detect false sharing in OpenMP programs. So it's, uh, it's very handy for that. That's a, that's a the, the sort of problem you have where uh, neighboring memory addresses are being accessed by different threads and causing cache flashing. It's really hard to detect any other way that, that this type of information. Okay, uh, that's the end of what I have. I'm very happy to take any questions or you know, or if anybody has their own uh, odd end tips and tricks to share, that would also be great. So you can either type in the chat box or you can try talking to us. It might, might even work. Mark, it's Adrian. So uh, in some of the material that I've seen from Cray on the XC30, they talk about the Intel Intel compiler and it creates helper threads for your OpenMP or something like that. Yeah. Uh, have you exp do you know? Have you played around with them at all? Have you seen the performance impact of them? I haven't. Um, no, this uh, I, I only I only heard about this the other day actually, and uh, I, I really don't know how that. I presume that that that, uh, that all plays nicely with uh, you know with with AP run and the way threads get bound and so on. But I I don't have any direct experience of that. You know, it, 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 I'd be surprised if it didn't do something sensible, but I really don't know what it does. Uh, question from Carmen on the chat. Um, can I comment on OpenMP task scheduling policies implementation used by different compilers? Um, you don't see any documentation on this. Uh, you don't and you won't because that's the sort of proprietary information about the details of the implementation that, uh, that vendors typically don't give away. Unfortunately, um, I mean you can. Uh, of course, for Vidu, you can go and have a look. <laughs> it's open source. You can go figure out what they do. Uh, so experience from benchmarking suggests that the, the GCC implementation of uh, of task scheduling isn't terribly smart or clever uh, compared with uh, compared with other compilers, um, but. Um, I don't. I don't know. Um, I suspect the answer for uh, other is, is that uh, they probably don't use a single queue. They probably use not a multiple queue structure with, with work stealing. But I, you know, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, the answer is no. Unfortunately, the. Um, we haven't found a good solution for recording these with suitable audio quality. Um, so that's that's something that we're that we're working on. Um, we'll try to we're looking for a sensible sensible solution for that. I did try and record most of it in, within the tool, but I have no idea what it would be like yet. Yeah. We've, we've tried it, but unfortunately, the the, uh, the quality has been pretty much unusable. But we're looking for another, another solutions for recording. Sorry. Okay, so if there's no more questions, uh, thank you very much for for 
listening in, and uh, I hope it was useful for you. Thank you.